good. Great. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hey. How are you doing? Good, good, good. Like a morning, a Monday morning? Nothing better than a Monday morning. Ah, okay. <laughs> With a lot of as, coffee. As long as we got coffee. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Speaking of, there's something I forgot. I just realized. Your coffee. My coffee. Oh, okay. Uh, I was having a morning chat, so I forgot about it. Uh, great. I think all our speakers are here. Yes, that's looking good. So we have, if I'm not mistaken, one book, chapter, and a paper. For those of you who are new to Neurogeno, the way it works is you just join us uh, Monday morning, bright and early with coffee or tea, um, and you present um, a paper or a book that caught your interest, and you just tell us why you thought it was really awesome and why you chose to present it. Uh, and that's it, and then we discuss it. So should we start with the paper? Because we tend to lose ourselves in the books. <laughs> Sure. Cool. Jan, take it away. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, so a paper that I was um, interested in was uh, Tools for the Body Schema by Marvita and Iriki from uh, 2004, I think. Um, do you want me to uh, share the screen or send you the link in the chat? Both, please. Both, both, both. We're, we're high maintenance. We want it all. <laughs> <laughs> Here is the um, lovely thank you. Link. And I'm going to share the link over on YouTube as well. So right. people know what we're talking um, about. Share screen, this screen. There we go. All right. <clears throat> Getting lost in my screens here. Um, okay. Um, like this. So anyway, the um, the um, main reason that I like this one so much is um, um, I'm trying to see everyone that is on here, but my my Zoom is just not cooperating. There we go. Okay. Now we got it. All right. So the um, the main thing here is uh, I think most of you probably are familiar with either the paper or the concept here, the tools for the uh, this, this body schema. So you know this idea that um, that if we look at the my favorite picture from all of neuroscience, um, this one here, um, that there's a receptive field for the poor monkey. So um, there's the, the individual receptive field and the somewhat sensor receptive field. So when there's something close to the hand, this, this field starts to get active. And then when the monkey starts to use the tool, this receptive field starts to incorporate the tool as well. Um, and uh, just for me, uh, this is just fascinating because we, we've seen this also something similar in humans, at least the last time I checked the literature. Um, so just, and, you know, this was always a classic and when I was teaching neuroscience and biopsych, this was always something that we kind of covered. And then I was looking out the window and there's an excavator going on and the guy is just extremely, extremely talented with the excavator. He is picking up tiny things um, with the excavator. And I thought to myself, I wonder if this also applies to things like the excavator, if, if his, if the the receptive field, the visual receptive field starts to expand and include the excavator. So it's you know, this huge machine that he's expanding into space. Um, and then of course, from there, I thought like brain machine interfaces and ex exoskeletons and things like that. Like where could we, could this knowledge help us in some ways when we're dealing with or, or um, designing those sorts of suits um, we know we've, we've started to use them in terms of um, uh, construction. That's, like a, that's one, one experimental way of using them to lifting things and moving things around. Um, deep diving, they use uh, big machines, uh, big um, diving uh, kind of, uh, not exoskeletons, but like 
uh, outfits, um, and then kind of the limitations of it, and and then you know that leads me into um, my favorite genre of of, um, of literature, the superhero uh, genre, like so what which which exoskeleton makes sense and which doesn't. Um, in there, uh, Rhino makes sense, uh, Iron Man makes sense, Scorpion. There is a we don't have a tail, so how would we be able to move the tail with what? part of our brains would we'd be using to to maneuver a, a mechanical tail so you know just by so that's where this poor monkey got me um basically down uh, down this um um little path uh, into thinking if the exoskeleton spider-man villains was was actually um viable or not so so that's kind of the quick and dirty of it and and i just uh, like i said i've always been fascinated by this this idea that well, there's this fact that our brains seem to expand their, their the receptive fields with the tool use, and I wonder how how uh, long that takes, and and um, how uh, permanent it is. Like the excavator dude that's out, outside here has probably been doing his job for decades. Does he not just have a permanent receptive field for this weird excavator thing, and that just ruins my uh, my. Uh, well, if he, he can do that, then um, apparently you can probably use the scorpion exoskeleton suit and move the tail as well. So there's that. So yeah, um, I don't really have much else about this. I was just uh, I was just so like I, I went down a rabbit hole yesterday actually of of the literature of brain machine interface and body schemas, and they don't seem to talk about it that much, which I was surprised. I thought that would be kind of well, let's see what we can do, but uh, yeah. Interested in your, in your thoughts about about this one? Thank you. Any questions about the paper, the concept, the superheroes? Patrick. Maybe I get one. Uh, I got one. So, so what do we actually know about it? Like, where does it stop? How big can our receptive field? become? Is there any estimate for that or studies that investigated it? I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I, I mean, I know that this one is for the hand, but not for the fingers, for example. So and most of the studies that they've done, I think, on, on the monkeys are expanding the hand, but not the finger receptive fields. So one of the things that they, they talk about in their paper is that that needs to be done next. So these sort of X X expanders for the hands and see if you can you can see the same sort of uh, expansion of the this receptive field um using that but uh, yeah i don't know how big it would be you mean in terms of the space how, how how far out in space we can have a go i mean both in terms on um how much of cortical space could potentially be included but also in terms of with the limitation of basically what object will still be incorporated. Like, as you said, if I am controlling a gigantic machine for some reason, right, that obviously has a different scale than me using, um, in this case, a an, an stick, for instance, as an additional tool. Mm -hmm. So the question really becomes like, where what what kind of tools will not be incorporated anymore in our body schemes, right? Is there a limitation to that? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, Some I have a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah maybe yeah. link um, to this. If Hang you on like... your mic. I, don't... I only hear you here. Can you hear her? Yes, I think you have to mute for a second. No, we cannot hear, Leah. Uh, yeah. Okay. No, good. we cannot meet. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. No, sorry. Um, I would like to ask if uh, this um, concept can be extended also to um, prosthesis in a clinical perspective. Maybe as uh, Patrick would say, if there is like a, lim a limitation or other things can be integrated in this kind of scheme. And uh, I was thinking about, yes, when you have a prosthesis uh, and uh, if uh, things change in your perspective in, uh, from this uh, uh, kind of uh, point of view, from this experiment. Oh, I cannot see another one. 
Mm. I think we lost our speaker. Ah, okay, so it's not me. <laughs> no, no, he's distracted. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I think it's it's a very uh, interesting question. Um, I can jump in if <laughs> in the meantime. sure to take um, it away. because yeah, it's a very interesting question, and I actually know about um, uh, wheelchairs. Um, people on wheelchairs, they they do embody the the wheelchair. They consider it as an extension or part of their uh, the very personal space for instance um, and the way they, they interact with the with, with tools and uh, the environment uh, changes this is what I'm... I was also wondering how that might relate to the rubber hand illusion where you embody the rubber hand that isn't part of you and then if someone hits the hand you actually pull away things like that so but i don't think it's it could be considered as a tool it's not a tool but you still embody a thing that doesn't actually belong to your body i'm sorry about that um <laughs> my, the perks of doing it from work <laughs> yeah 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 um i mean you, you I, I i um you guys are very important but my boss came in so she she had she takes precedence um but uh in terms of the prosthetics, there is actually uh, a study out um, uh, where they used this concept on a girl. I think that she had lost her limbs or was born without her limbs. This was just one of these that were skimming, and they saw something similar in in her her um, her brain responses. So there were actually this seems to be something that we have regardless of uh, so it's not something that that we need our limbs to to have so they were able to use this to help her to to uh, control some some limbs okay thank you cool chris has been patiently waiting for a while <laughs> um thanks um just uh, uh, about so what about a uh, virtual reality because uh I am, I'm guessing that it would also expand our um, field, but of course it's difficult because it's not a physical field. In that case, it would be a virtual field. Um, and, and also, uh, I'm guessing it could also potentially be a tool to study that because we could have a bunch of very controlled um, uh, experiments, uh, but have very, um, like, things that you can't really test in real life because they are too complicated to put in place. I don't know if you read something about virtual reality and the um, this perception field. Uh, I think there was something, um, there's a paper that's one of these multiple tabs that I have open now. So I think they've started to, to expand Explore that, but I, I I didn't have time to use it. But it makes sense, though, if you're if you're controlling an avatar that has at least the, that starts off with a similar body structure as you, that you'd be able to control it, and it would activate similar uh, areas. Um, and, and oh through. yeah, I just thought um, there is this experiment where they s basically swap. I have the feeling that they swap bodies, like they they have a, a, a virtual reality headset. And um, for a little bit, they uh, touch the limbs. Uh, and so they see themselves through uh, as if they were uh, seeing through the eyes of someone else's body. Yeah. And, and uh, so when they are touched in, um, uh, in what they see, uh, they are also touched in real life. So... Yeah. To confuse their their brain and at some point they start feeling that they are in the body of the other one so i'm guessing that the the perception field would also extend with virtual reality i guess there are some studies yeah so i know that there's a few trials as well with vr and stroke recovery to kind of trick the brain into recovering the function of a limb um by using a similar method but I, don't know the details of it but there's definitely studies that look into that direction now that's nice uh two more questions valentina 
Thank you. Um, so I, my question is about the, um, the picture that you're showing um, on uh, the paper. So uh, what's the difference from uh, between uh, the top part and the bottom part? Um, how did they measure the embodiment or the, the changing uh, of the space uh, uh, according to the hand or uh, the, the shoulder? Um, they, they use a single, um, like there is a single neuron here. Um, so I'm not sure how accurate that would be. That is one slight, uh, flaw perhaps. Um, but it just seems like the, this, this changes, um, the, the lower one is just the, the whole range of motions or anything that this, this could actually touch. Uh, any area, so any sort of movement that that comes within that res receptive field uh, starts to activate it. I think that's, uh, does that make sense? Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Patrick, back to you. So that's, it's a bit tricky, but I'm wondering, what do we actually know about the mechanism here? that is in place to actually achieve this. So my question goes into the direction, like, do we know anything about the neurobiological mechanism that actually enables this or the, um, let's say the requirements, like, do you need to have visual input and see what your hand is doing in order to incorporate it? Or does it just facilitate um, incorporating, incorporating uh, a tool into your body scheme. Um, can you do it without even visual input? Because as far as I remember, the um, I might be mistaken here, but but I think I I read something a while ago um, that you need to have like multiple modality input in order for this to work. So. Could that be achieved due to other factors as well? Do you know anything about that? No, but um, I mean, they, they they only talk about the visual receptive field and the and the somatosensory ones. And it would be interesting to see if, for example, some sort of if we if we would have at least something similar in an auditory receptive field, because you know we, we can locate uh, sound in space, um, and people with without vision have have been known to have even, even slightly enhanced uh, abilities compared to us here and, or you can train yourself to be uh, be that way so there you know the um, the the people who do the um, the echolocation there's a, a number of individuals that have been able to to kind of use echolocation so it'd be really interesting to see for example how how their um, how their body schema is and how their receptive fields are using just auditory. Uh, but then like for any, any one of us who is, who is seeing and, and, and if we actually have other sort of receptive fields, if we can, if we can use that as well, um, it'd be really interesting. I haven't, I haven't seen anything else, but it would make sense that auditory receptive fields would, would also be a thing because we can locate things based on, on sound. But you typically don't hear your own body, right? So if I, if I move my hand, um, I have no additional information coming into my mind about the positioning of my hand, for instance, or if I move like an, an object within my hand, mm -hmm. I can't really hear it, right? So potentially one could look into a fun study where if you do this, but with like an object that actually makes a sound where you can then use echolocation or sorry, auditory um, location and, and it might uh, impact your body scheme actually. Like in contrast to me just waving an object that doesn't make sound, does, does this make sense what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, but although I do think that um, so, in, in these studies, they just move something into the, the visual field, right? Right. So, and when when it is in with within the grasp of the, the hand and the tool, then the the uh, the uh, some of the sensory field is activated. So, you might 
be able to and it's just this is just anecdotal like when i go caving or something when i'm in complete darkness and i and i hear something i feel like i know where it is in terms of mm. my location in space so i don't see anything and it and i just i hear dripping or, or some sort of echoing off the cave and i feel like i know where it is in within in relation to my body i wonder if something similar could could then yeah. happen so you, I, i'm but um yeah i haven't i haven't put the app on in, in a cave yet so <laughs> should be doing that cool. yeah i know <laughs> thanks a lot <laughs> yeah. any other questions no. Well, in that case, thank yeah. you so much for. Did you have one, Valentina? No, another question, but I comment. Uh, I think it's really interesting what Patrick said, actually. And uh, I was trying to remember if there are any uh, studies on, uh, um, like, uh, um, the the concept of uh, um, space uh, and uh, and auditory stimuli. Um, but um, uh, on the visual field, it's actually uh, interception plays uh, uh, a big role in that. So uh, maybe in the cave situation, uh, you are uh, just actually feeling your body. So you don't need uh, the, the visual uh, feedback. Uh, and I was wondering whether, yeah, um, uh, the auditory uh, stimuli could could help in the, in that situation, like feeling uh, I don't know the breathing or uh, if it's uh, echoed or not. Or um, it's it's interesting. It's Batman basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's very interesting if you do any sort of uh, stuff like that. How you notice? Maybe it's because you try to be aware of what you're learning. You you start you take someone down in the cave that has never been there before and they're completely lost in the dark. But if you've been doing it for a while, you start to notice the sounds, like you said, the echo sounds different in a, in a bigger cave. And even visually, before you get in, you start to see changes in the landscape where there's probably something there and someone's with you that hasn't done caving, they just see green grass, right? So it's, it's really weird how your body starts to pick up or your senses are pick up things that that others don't uh, after a while. So yeah, uh, it's but in terms of, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of makes me want to go caving now and see what it's like. <laughs> yeah, come on over. <laughs> well, great. Uh, thanks for that paper. That was very, very interesting. Uh, and thanks for joining us. I know it's bright and early for you uh, over in Iceland. <laughs> uh, hence the caving. Um, all right, thanks for, for the paper. We're moving on to the book chapter, if you're ready, Amy. I'm already, yes. Always ready. Great. If you could share the link and share your screen, take uh, it away. Share the link. Uh, okay, I don't remember the link. Okay, let's find it. Thanks. <laughs> Not so ready then, are we? <laughs> Uh, ta, 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 ta. Let's find it very quick. Yes. Okay. And the chat. Ah, uh, Monday morning. Complicated. Okay. <laughs> so good. No, good. Um. Okay. So I, can I share my screen? I think I can do that. Yes. Share. Okay, and uh, is it working? Okay, is it good for you? Yeah, okay, I start. Uh, okay, oh, nice, at the end, let's start by the beginning of it. <laughs> okay. So yes, uh, I wanted to talk about the, this book, uh, The Science of Science. So it's not about neuroscience, neuroscience per se. Uh, it's more about uh, science in general. Uh, let me put that somewhere else. Uh, and uh, yes, it's more about science in general. And uh, I think, uh, so I saw this book uh, in a tweet of uh, Paul Thompson and uh, I was, uh, I was um, curious about the, the title and uh, 
and uh, so I decided to read it. Uh, so the, the book is about uh, the emergence of a new field, let's say uh, this way. Uh, it's a science of science. So looking a little bit uh, about it or reading about it, so I, I found this definition. Uh, science of science is based on a transdisciplinary approach that uses uh, large data sets to study the mechanisms underlying the doing of science. So we had this, uh, so when I, uh, I talk about this uh, chapter last week, uh, Steffi was, uh, was talking about the, the brain uh, is the only organ uh, able to study itself. So I think here it's a, a kind of the same thing in the way uh, it's a research of, uh, so it's research, uh, it's research about research. So it's, uh, it's kind of interesting to see this uh, point of view. So in the book, it's, uh, they talk about, uh, they say that uh, these practitioners of science of science use the scientific methods to study themselves. So it's, uh, it's looking at, uh, at yourself in a way. Uh, the reason for this uh, field to emerge is, uh, so we know uh, there is a lot of scientific prediction uh, now. It has increased uh, dramatically. Uh, the, the few decades uh, ago. And uh, now we have a, a bunch of papers and uh, to study and uh, we can study them digitally. So you can look at this paper and uh, extract some numbers and uh, look at how it's going. Uh, uh, one of the, the, the mean of this, uh, of this field is also to explore uh, scientific production and reward. And uh, when I, uh, I read it, um, I, I said it's, uh, I think it's a really good book for for students uh, if, uh, if they want to start a, a career uh, in research. I think it will be a, a very uh, interesting uh, point of view, and also for researcher to have a kind of insight of uh, what we are doing and if we are doing it uh, right. Uh, okay, uh, so this book has uh, four chapters, and uh, I read only one. Uh, so uh, I'm a lazy guy. But uh, I think that was in the tweet of Paul Thompson. And uh, I say, yeah, let's, uh, let's start. Uh, so I, I, I didn't know at the beginning it was a book. So I, I read the chapter uh, by itself. So I read the, the science of collaboration. So that was intriguing. And I wanted to know uh, a little bit about uh, uh, more about it. And so this uh, chapter is uh, how do scientists uh, collaborate and work together in teams? Uh, so there is a, a very important point here that uh, the definition of team, uh, a team uh, for us, it can be uh, the same person of the lab, for example, uh, but in the book, it's a, it's a, they took another perspective in the way they, a team can be a group of colleagues, uh, so we know that, but it can be a, a group of collaborators, but also the way they uh, define it, it can be also co-authorship, so all the, the people from the same uh, the authors of the same paper. Uh, so there is a lot of info. Uh, some of the ideas uh, in this uh, chapter, you, you are really interesting. Uh, okay, let's start uh, with the first part of this, uh, of this book, uh, which is the increasing dominance of teams in science. Uh, so they, uh, they say that now, publication research is made of, uh, of teams more than a uh, single uh, people, single uh, person. So to illustrate uh, this fact, they, uh, they made these uh, very uh, nice uh, plots where you can see, can I put uh, a pointer? So here you can see the, um, the years and you see the, the, uh, the, paper, the, the number of person in the authorship. So you can see the more the, the years going on and uh, the increase of uh, people in the authorship for most of the of the of the field and except for uh, maybe this arts and uh, humanities uh, research field is another way to look at it uh, here you can see uh, in pink you have the single authors papers and uh, you have in blue the within school collaboration and the between school collaboration in Kind of black. So you can see there is a decrease of single author and increase of uh, between school collaboration, meaning uh, between universities, between countries. 
Okay, uh, so the reason for this increase, uh, the, the, the way they present it is the, it's a way of creating uh, innovative and uh, combination, uh, innovative combination of ideas and concepts. So you put people from different uh, from different fields, so you can have really uh, interesting point of view, different point of view uh, for for looking at a specific topic, and also it's boosting the visibility of researchers, so to new quarters and disciplines. So it's true that when you are uh, working with someone who is very famous, for example, uh, you get some of the credit for you because you are working with a not only a single one, but with a team, a great team, you get credit for it. Um, there is different drivers. Uh, they point out uh, the increase of complexity. So they took the example of the of the of the CERN with the world largest particle collider. So, if you are a single researcher, it's impossible to to make it uh, uh, to make it for for yourself. And so uh, there is uh, a compensation, uh, let's say in this way, uh, there is a, a broadening knowledge uh, by pu uh, putting people together because we have a tendency researcher now to, to get very specialized in a, in a, in a specific uh, topic. And so when you want to have a more larger view, you need to bring people uh, together. It's also true that it's easier to collaborate with the internet uh, and that they, they mentioned uh, also it's this way or you can think it's it's great you you can collaborate through internet and uh, stuff like that it creates also inequality uh, between elites so there is a point that uh, they so when people uh, are uh, collaborating with other countries they work with the same level of uh, research so if you are a top scientist you will work with a top scientist in uh, in other countries but not with the the the, the below uh, research uh, with the researcher below the, the top uh, scientist. And another point is a uh, bad side of it is uh, the brain drain. Uh, it means country that uh, do not uh, have uh, money to, to keep their researcher, they, they lose uh, their researcher. And another interesting thing uh, is uh, about the, the, um, the team, uh, the bad, uh, bad, uh, bad effect of it is that team are not optimized for discovery. So it can be, it was not comfortable to, to hear that, but it's true that when you have big team, you need uh, a lot of, uh, it costs in terms of time and energy to, to make this team working together uh, because you need to coordinate things and uh, you need to improve communication, stuff like that. So uh, here's another uh, example of this increase of uh, team, uh, this uh, team research. So, and also these worldwide, uh, worldwide contrast. So if you look at uh, Europe and the United, uh, United States, you see, so here's the same thing, uh, years here and uh, the publications paper. So you see in dashed, uh, dashed blue, you have the domestic paper and uh, in not, non-dash blue, the non-domestic paper. So there is an increase of uh, papers with collaboration. So you can see that. So you have the same thing in emerging countries, uh, So, but not the same curve. So you see there is a, a lot of increase of both of them with a, a tendency to any way to increase the, the, the collaboration. Okay, so that was the point of this, uh, of this part. The second part is uh, how so the invisible college, it's uh, about how teams are constituted. Uh, so this part talk about the peer effect in science and high quality collaborators. So they make the point that uh, scientists uh, become great because uh, they are surrounded by great scientists. It's kind of uh, inertia of the, uh, of the, the way it's, uh, it's working. Uh, so they talk about also high quality collaborators. So you have a, when you, are, you, you have a big, a big shot in the team, it's increased publication, it increased also faculty ring. So the depart department get uh, credit for it and can hire other uh, people. And the detrimental effect was that uh, when you lose this big shot, it can be bad. So they made, uh, they, they, they made example of it. Uh, and they talk about, so I, I really like this uh, star scientist versus helpful scientist. So they make this distinction between the scientists. So they say that 
the star scientists are the kind of people with uh, working for high impact papers, working fast, uh, kind of solo, uh, versus uh, the helpful uh, scientists that are more uh, problem solvers that are slow because when you have issues, sometimes it's difficult to solve solve this issue very fast and they are more collegial so they work for the the big team or the big department uh, instead of uh, for themselves uh, so the point that they made is you need both uh, of them uh, for for the team uh, to work so it's two two side of this uh, the teams needs these two two sides uh co-authorship networks so this part talk about co-authorship and networks and as neuroscientists, we love uh, networks. The brain is a network, so we love networks. So this part was uh, also uh, pretty interesting. And they start with uh, Paul Erdos, who I didn't know. Uh, it's a Hungarian mathematician uh, who published more than uh, 500 papers, very prolix uh, uh, authors. And they derive uh, a kind of impact factors uh, from uh, from this guy. So they call it the Erdos number. Uh, so to give you uh, the, the the way it works, so Erdos, uh, Paul Erdos is number zero. If you publish uh, directly with this guy, you get the number one, okay? So these guys who publish with him, so who have the number one, if they publish with other guys, uh, these other guys will get the number two and so on. Okay, so you get like that so kind of collaborative distance between Erdos numbers. So you can, so as Paul Erdos was a, a big shot, you can say, yeah, this guy is better than this one, it's kind of. So I don't like this uh, way of measuring things, but kind of uh, giving a, a insight of uh, what, uh, what the thing is doing. So it's giving the collaborative distance between people. And uh, as I say, this kind of a citation and this. Uh, okay, so after that, they look at the networks uh, of people. So here you have a, a single author, a uh, single, not a single author, but author, and you look at all the papers, uh, all the articles of this of these guy, and you see how the other authors are constituting uh, a network. So here's an example, and but for most of them, you see that it's a few highly connected nodes and also very densely connected communities. So you see teams working together, they are uh, grouped together. So it's that has the characteristics, the characteristics of the small world network. So that was a point. Uh, it was a uh, was a um, uh, there was a uh, discussing, and uh, it makes sense in a way. We don't work with random people. We work with people we know, or we work with people we do research with. So. Okay, so they make uh, they made these uh, the parallel with uh, the Broadway musical artist and looking at the small worldliness uh, index or the W. So the study was looking at artists in uh, in Broadway and the outputs of uh, how they decided if the the network was working or not was looking at the shows if the the show of a certain group was uh, giving a lot of entries and stuff like that so they they found that you can yeah you can find different networks so the first one is uh, as a low uh, worldliness let's say that so low cognitivity and cohesion because um he has no creative action so people are more working alone they share some ideas but not a lot so make make it not very creative you have the, the medium one, which is great because people are working to, together. So it's optimal connectivity and cohesion. And in this way, they share creativity to make a, a big show, a great show. And you have the opposite, uh, the extreme uh, IW. So this is a community, a community of people who are used to work uh, together, but they don't uh, share their ideas with uh, outsiders. And that can create a liability for creativity because it's only internal. You kind of create an inbreeding creativity. You need a, yeah. So it's not good for to get a fertile uh, ground. Okay. Team assembly. Uh, this part I like, uh, I like a lot because they make the comparison 
between researcher and chicken. So we know uh, researcher are, are chicken. So, so uh, the parallel th they were uh, making that was the, so the example they took. Um, so that was this study about a guy in the chicken industry. He wanted to create a, a super uh, chicken uh, team. So what is a, what he, he did was uh, he, he took all the great chicken in the, in the, not in the population, but uh, in, uh, in, in his population. So the, the chicken with uh, high productivity and he put them together and uh, he compared them uh, with a normal chicken group. So with a productive, but not great. So the surprising uh, results of that. So he led them breeding for different generations. Uh, and uh, at the end, he looked at the cage where the super, uh, super chicken were and he got only three of them left and in pretty bad shape because instead of making the productivity great, they fought uh, each other. So they took their time, they used their time only to fight each other. So that this example is great, but is it really, are we really a chicken? That is a, it's a good point. So he took this example of uh, the Duke uh, English department. So a guy in this department was uh, hired to hire other people. So he was very great to that. So he hired very great talents uh, in the department. So when the, uh, so there was different reviews uh, of the department. So the first review was very great. So people were really pretty happy with the, the way the department was working. But after a, a period of time, uh, what happened that uh, the reviewers came back to, to look at this department because they say, yeah, it will become a really great department. But it was again, the opposite. So a lot of them left and uh, the one who stayed uh, the same, in the same way as the chicken uh, for each other, which made the department not great uh, again. So the point here is that you need talented uh, researcher, but you need a researcher working together. Uh, they look at different variables uh, of uh, variable that can affect uh, uh, teams. Uh, so they look at gender diversity, uh, ethnic diversity, affiliation diversity, age diversity. The, the, the main uh, variable uh, was uh, the, the, the variable with a, with the, 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 the most impact on the, on the yeah, they use a citation count, uh, was the, the ethnic diversity. Uh, so they say that, yeah, again, if you put people with different culture, education, different point of view, you will get, you, you will get better, uh, a better team. Okay. So they conclude this part looking at if they could kind of making an equation of how teams uh, work together. So they started, uh, they stated that, uh, okay, so let's say a team is, uh, is, uh, is constituted of newcomers, so let's say rookies, and incumbents, that are the veterans. So you can derive different parameters for these, uh, for these teams. So you have the incumbency parameter, the p-value, and the, so the p, value, the p p parameter represents the fraction of incumbents within a team. So if you increase this p uh, parameter, what you get, so looking at the output, which is the, the journal citation and uh, uh, the publications, you see an increase of high impact journals, which makes sense because you have experience. So if you put people with a great experience together, you will get more papers, makes sense in a way. You look at the diversity parameter uh, Q, which uh, that captures uh, the degree of to which veterans involve their former collaborators. So it's a, it's kind of tricky this one because Q means uh, the, the veterans works not with outsider, but with people he knows, for example, former students or former uh, colleagues. And when you increase, so when you look at teams with a, uh, I uh, Q a parameter, you have a decrease of high impact journal. So we, we come back, we come back to the, the kind of Broadway uh, article where you don't get ideas from outside. You keep yourself uh, between yourself. So the conclusion was experience matter, but you need uh, new ideas and approach, uh, approaches in your team. Okay. Uh, this part uh, is about uh, small and large teams. So 
And here's a, a kind of uh, just showing you uh, something. So talking about large team. So I want to, to show you this, uh, this paper. So it's a, uh, I will not go off in it, but it's a, it's a paper about uh, X boson. So it's a physics uh, article. So you see it's a, it's a 33 pages, uh, pages uh, long. Uh, so you start with that abstract uh, and everything is about X boson. So I will not explain anything about it. So equations, some graphs, very nice, very nice. So you go and oh, again, graphs, very nice. So, and references, so something classical. We are eight page uh, at the uh, eighth uh, page. So what else? So maybe some supplemental uh, results. So no, authors, okay, interesting. Uh, what else? Authors, okay. Again, okay, again, 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 again. Okay, uh, I made my point. So this paper is 5,000 uh, authors uh, long, which is the biggest in uh, history. So it's nice. So large, large, large team. So, okay, let's put back. Um, so what do we make uh, about, uh, about that? So uh, as I said at the beginning, so we are moving to more, uh, to large, uh, larger team because you have more brain power and diverse uh, perspective. And uh, so, as I said at the beginning, you have also coordination and communication issues when you have large team. And there is also a tendency to, to be less innovative and risk averse. So when you have a large, so the, the point they are making here is that you, you have a lot of money, so you have a large team, but you need to be careful how you spend it. So it's, you don't need, you don't want to put your money like uh, to waste your money. So you, you, you are very careful about the research you are doing. So they, they try to, to look at the, so they, they developed this idea of developing and disrupting, which is also in the industry now. Uh, so they try to derive these uh, parameter from the, from the paper. And I, I really like this way of presenting a, a, a paper. So just to show you in blue, uh, you have the article, okay, you are looking at. And you have the, the citation, the references in gray. Okay, so classical, you describe your work and uh, you put a citation in it. So the subsequent work are here in green and uh, in purple. So you see that with the arrows, so the green arrows means, uh, or the, 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 the arrows coming from the greens mean you are referencing this paper only and not the previous work. Okay, and the the purple ones are referencing this work, the actual paper, but also the previous uh, article, the citation, the references. Okay, and from that you can derive a number which is a descripting uh, parameter. So if you cite only this paper, ah, oh, let's put, take the green one. If you cite only the blue one and not the previous one, it's meaning it's a new work, it's something very new. If you are citing this paper, but also the citation, it means you are kind of developing uh, an idea uh, that was developed before. So is uh, the way it works. So you can also make, it's the same representation. You have the references here, your article. And if you have green, it's kind of new. And if you have uh, purple, uh, it's kind of developing, so descripting. And they took these two very famous article. Uh, so, and they made this very nice tree about it. Um, so you have one with mostly developing because uh, citing uh, this paper, but also the references. And you have this paper, which is more descripting because all the paper are only citing this one. And the, the point they want to, to, to make here is that uh, looking, so, the citation is almost the same, but the team size is kind of different. So the team size is smaller for this one than for this one. And they want to make the, the point that um, uh, when you are a small team, you kind of district, and where, when, when you are a big team, you kind of develop. Uh, because small teams, uh, so 
they uh, they talk about small teams saying that they took older and less popular uh, ideas and so more risky in a way and instead a large team more tech recent work so something which was developed by someone else and uh, with higher impact it is more fashion uh, in a way uh, this graph is showing that. So this is the size of the team and the disruptive or disruption uh, index. So you see the, the larger is the team, uh, the smaller is the, the D index. Here again, you need both small and large team uh, in, in, in research because they are crucial to a healthy scientific ecosystem. But the tendency now uh, in research is that they are even for grants and uh, for money, uh, they have a tendency to 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 um, to push uh, forward large team uh, instead rather than a, a small team. Uh, so the problem is you need these small teams to to supply uh, new ideas to to large team. Is the way they they present it. Um, I'm pretty long. Yeah, I'm pretty long. Uh, scientific credit. Uh, so they uh, they discuss about how you get credit uh, and how it worked. Uh, so they started with uh, this way, uh, three articles from three Nobel Prize winners. And uh, the way you see the authorship, it's not easy to decide who is the, the Nobel Prize. So it can be the last, the first, in the middle. So they uh, uh, discussed about the different way of, um, of doing authorship. So the, the one we know in neuroscience is uh, the first and the last. Uh, so we put uh, the, the, the most important authors in this, uh, in this system is the first and the last. So example is uh, the, so in plus, uh, they ask the contribution of each author in the paper. So if you look at that, you see that mostly the first and the last, so green and uh, dark green and pink, are the are the person the person that are more contributing to the paper, and it's the same thing here. Uh, even with a, a increasing number of photos, is always the same. Uh, that system is the one we use, but he, yeah, take to this example here. Uh, oh, back to that, just to show you that. I was pretty surprised, but uh, let's go back to an example here. This is a paper about NR NRF2, which uh, that I don't know. But uh, what is interesting, this is a paper, but uh, here you can see what is interesting about it. Uh, uh, yes, uh, the retraction has been agreed as all authors cannot agree on a revised author order and at least one author continued to dispute the original order. So this paper was never published. So it's, it's bad. And because they couldn't agree. Uh, so uh, interesting fact. Uh, the other way of doing authorship, okay, next slide, is from A to Z. Uh, it's an alphabetical order. Uh, so to define it uh, or to show how it can be strong in different fields, uh, for example, mathematics and physics. Here's the American Medical Society. Uh, in most areas of mathematics, joint research is a sharing of ideas and skills that cannot be attributed to the individual separately. Researchers' roles are seldom differentiated as they are in the laboratory science, uh, sciences, for example. Determining which person contributed which ideas is often meaningless because the ideas grows from complex discussions among all partners. So it makes sense. Uh, so it is another way of doing. Uh, one of the bias and also an interesting, uh, interesting fact here is that um, uh, here is, they took the example of economy, but I think you can find the same uh, side effect in other fields. So women economists uh, face an enormous penalty for collaborating. So when I read that, I say, strange, why? Uh, so here you look at the, uh, uh, at the graph where you see the fraction of paper that solo author. So if you are here, you publish alone. And if you are here, you have a lot of uh, collaboration. On this axis, uh, you have the, the, the way, uh, not the way, but the, if you get a tenure position at the end. 
okay? So when you are solo authored, everything that's kind of saying it's fine. So male and female have the same rate of getting the tenure position. But if you start to collaborate, it's bad for women. And just to saying about the bias, in this field, they use the A to Z uh, alphabetical order. Uh, and uh, the way they explain this uh, uh, relationship is that doing that, you don't know, the order doesn't give a clue about who did what. But in this process, you allow a gender-based judgment. You see women and men. And if you have an old generation guy looking at the bar, you say, we'll say, yeah, this is the man who did that. Pretty bad, but uh, I think it was a, uh, it was a good point to, to say that. Not that the woman uh, didn't uh, do the job, but uh, a good explanation for, for this uh, kind of bias. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, okay, uh, the last part is about credit allocation. How, so before I, I talk about credit, but credit allocation meaning in the, uh, in the meaning that how it's practically given and not theoretically. And they talk about the Matthew effect. So the Matthew effect uh, state that when scientists with different levels of eminence are involved in a joint work, the more we know it, uh, scientists get disproportionately greater credit regardless of who did what in the project. So you can derive, you can derive that for different things. So for example, uh, they, uh, they talk about the, this sentence, uh, which is pretty famous, standing on the shoulders of the giant, who uh, that was attributed to Newton, but in fact, it was not uh, from Newton, but from Bernard de Chartres, a philosopher of, 12th, of the 12th uh, century. But yeah, forget uh, about him, uh, about him uh, because he will stay to Newton uh, uh, and he will stay for him. Uh, another point uh, they made uh, in this part uh, is, uh, so they took an interview of a Nobel uh, laureate a uh, big shot. And he was saying, uh, you have a student. So it's about how you give credit to a student when you have a, when you are a, a big shot. Uh, should you put your name on that paper or not? You have contributed to it, but is it better that you should not or should? There are two sides to it. If you don't, there are the possibility that the paper may go quite unrecognized. Nobody reads it. But if you do, it may be recognized, but not for the student. <laughs> but then the student doesn't get enough credit. Okay. So, uh huh. Okay. 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 And uh, they uh, they uh, finish with this kind. So based on this uh, this fact, uh, they say, uh, okay, let's try to derive a, a credit allocation algorithm uh, where you can uh, so. They made this algorithm based on the citation of the paper, so I will not go in detail. Uh, but what they made about it is, uh, and I think it's uh, two important points, is that recognition is based on the long run and on, on one shot. So you can publish a very great article. If you don't continue to publish on the same topic, you will not, you will not get recognized. And another point, uh, recognition may be predetermined, uh, predetermined uh, uh, from your starting point. And it can be uh, kind of uh, not the way you are thinking. So if you start with a, a, a bad team, yeah, it can be bad for you, but you can maybe get over it. If you start in a very good team, it can be difficult uh, to get the credit uh, you deserve because you, you are in a big team and the big shot is very famous. Uh, even if you publish with him, you will not, you will not get recognized. So it's an interesting point. And I will stop here. Lovely, thank you. I have so many questions and comments for you, um, but I'm very aware of the time. When you said you're presenting at TEPTA, I didn't expect. <laughs> to get such a detailed run through. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's great. I absolutely loved it. Um, but we're out of time. So um, are there any burning questions? No, in that case, um, 
uh, feel free to hang around a little bit to ask the non-burning questions, but we're going to release everyone online. Um, we shared the links as well, and there was a demand to get the papers that you showed as examples um, as a link ah. in the chat as well. Okay. Um, great. That is it for this week. Uh, everyone over on YouTube, have a lovely week uh, in science this week, and we see you next Monday. For you guys here, if you want to hang around a few minutes and put your questions to Eve, uh, feel free to do so. Bye, everyone.